so far a brief review of uh, different technologies. I'm sure if you go out and do your own research, you'll find some other technologies that I didn't talk about. Uh, uh, but you know, they, basically everything is based on what I told you. And I, I please remember again, everything that you saw so far, except the flat panel TV, they're all prototypes saying. You know, people are working on it. They are making them better, and they are trying to make them more viable financially, econ economically, and to see if they can actually sell those. So what are the challenges for renewable energy? Three challenges. It's the cost, always cost, uh, intermittency, and production difficulty. We can't do anything with production difficulty. You know, we have to learn, learn, develop machineries, and these kind of things to develop the uh, like good system and low cost system to uh, produce those technologies. But we might be able to do things regarding the cost and intermediacy. So how we can tackle cost? We can increase efficiency, basically from the same system that costs us a certain amount of money by increasing efficiency we get more power. So basically cost per generated uh, unit of power or energy drops. But people are working on efficiency, but efficiency changes are going to be in the range of like 1 or 2 percent. There isn't going to be like a drastic change in efficiency. I mean, suddenly efficiency is not going to double. Okay. It's kind of gradually will increase as we learn more and the technology actually advances. The other one is the, the use of power electronics. Currently, for PV technology, there are like three main uh, power electronics that people use. There are DC optimizers, microinverters, and the sub panel level power management. The third one is what I've been working for in the past three years. And actually, our company announced it uh, publicly two days ago, so I'm allowed to announce it here to you. So far, it was not a secret. No one knew about it. So now you're the first people to know in, in our media. This is happening. A very quick uh, overview of why power electronics are important. Uh, solar panels, uh, solar cells give you a small voltage because it's just a diode. Diode voltage is in the range of like 0.5 to 0.7, right? So in order to get the voltages like 420 or 480 volts, we have to put this diode in series to build up the voltage. However, because uh, PV cells act like current source, basically this group of uh, long uh, cells that are working next to each other, if there is a weak cell, that is weak either because of you know, some manufacturing problems or it's shaded, by shadow or at least is uh, uh, kind of uh, falls on the panel or things like this, it's going to be the weak link in this team. And everybody is familiar with this saying that a team is as strong as its weakest link. Right? Nobody wants to be the weak link of a team. Uh, so therefore, if in this like string of let's say 100 or 200 cells, one of the cells is kind of weak for whatever reason, the whole cell is jeopardized and it's not going to generate electricity. So they use power electronics like DC optimizer, the microinverter, and the sub panel level to isolate the cells from each other. So if one of the cells is weak, it doesn't affect the entire system. Okay. Uh, we can, uh, to, to reduce the cost, we have to create better manufacturing processes. I've been to China and India, and I, 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 I kind of looked at how people build these uh, panels, because most of the solar panels are, are being built in China and India, as we speak. There are some in Korea and Japan as well. But everything is ha uh, happens manually. So there are these people, they grab the cell, they put it on the uh, table, they solder the wires by hand, one by one, and kind of, it take, takes like three hours to build one panel, okay? So that's one of the reasons that most people prefer to do the manufacturing in countries like China or India, because labor is, uh, is, is, is inexpensive, so they can push the product. But if the manufacturing processes are improved and everything is automated, there is no reason 
to do the manufacturing in those places, right? Because everything just happens, and you don't need to then, you know, capture it down. So this is another area that really, really people can contribute. The solar power as an industry is so new, is at like its infant stages, that people haven't developed machinery for building this. So if it, if it someone comes up with an idea to have like this big machinery to build like solar panel in like one minute, boom, that, that's a fantastic achievement. Balance of system. What is balance of system? To, to generate electricity from solar panel, we, only, we don't need the solar panel only. We need a lot of things around it. We need cables, we need the racks to hold the solar panels. If they're tracking the sun, we need the electric motors, software, we need like inverters to convert this DC voltage to AC, we need all the circuit breakers, control system, everything, everything, like fault detection. We, we need so many things to actually put together a solar power system. Anything other than the solar panel or the cell itself is called balance of system. And as we speak, actually from the entire uh, uh, balance of system comprises about 50% of the cost of a solar power system. It's a huge uh, portion of that. So if somehow a system can be redesigned or something someone can do to reduce the balance of system cost, it's going to be a huge uh, contribution. Shipping and installation too. As I said, everything is being uh, manufactured in East Asia and are being shipped back to where they need to install. And the way they do, so basically the whole solar panel is a, is a tiny sheet. It's like your student ID. Right, it's like laminated between two layers, and that's it. It's like a piece of cardboard. But they put it in big um, frames and all these kind of things. It becomes bulky to be shipped. So it takes a lot of space, and the shipping companies charge a lot of money. It's also heavy. So the shipping and even installation is a big deal in this uh, uh, arena. And also the operation. So we install the system there, especially imagine like a utility scale uh, solar system. You have, let's say, one million solar panels. And, uh, you know, somehow you have to understand you know, if, if your solar panels are operating well, if there is a problem with any one of these solar panels, and if there is one, which one of these one million panels has a problem? You know, you can send someone to check this one which one million panels. Uh, we listen to grow uh, solar beams. Uh, hey, solar paint. Yes. Uh, we talk about right now about some uh, solar panels. Yes. Uh, but I listen about uh, paint solar. You can paint it in your uh, roof and uh, no panels, only lighting. Yes. How you paint? What you listen about that? Yes, I, I, I've heard those ideas too, but uh, as I so those are those basically go in the category of a thin film solar panels because they basically have particles in the paint that somehow uh, they basically connect electrically to each other and it's supposed to generate electricity. But if you read the literature properly, you have to be careful about. Um, about the reliability, that that is one very important thing. I mean, which paint has lasted for 30 years? I don't know. You know? Pardon me? Thank you. Like, thin film uh, technology is uh, very inefficient. You know, they are like hardly about like 10 or even less than 10 percent efficient. Which, again, someone can argue that and say, hey, you know what? You say solar panel is free, so I don't care about efficiency. Someone can argue that. But if you compare the efficiency, the efficiency is lower, and the reliability, and all this, this balance of system that is going to come around it. As a research uh, project, it's, it's a fantastic idea, and good to think about it. Right now, the real problem is uh, because uh, uh, 
all the technologies are right now very expensive, yes? Absolutely. Why uh, all the world could just really, uh, right, it's uh, great, just the sun uh, give us uh, free energy mm. and we can use it's free, but uh, right now, uh, most, uh, one of the most expensive for energy, yes, it's uh, uh, solar energy, yes? And if uh, uh, we can realize, uh, I, I uh, write somewhere, uh, because I ask you about that, yes, uh, about that pain, but it's, uh, if, if uh, scientists can realize that, you can everywhere, uh, you can uh, use it everywhere, in cars, yes, in, uh, I don't know, in uh, faces, uh, in uh, all roofs, yes, all, uh, everywhere. Absolutely. Yes. So, as I said, as, as a research thing, it's great, so people are working on that, they, they have the issue to keep working on that, to bring funding, but at this point it's not ready to become commercialized yet. You know, yeah, at some point it may prove to be the best thing, and you know, if it goes out of business, everybody takes the wall.
tell people, hey, you know, this is the thing. So people start becoming concerned about, you know, the side effects that you mentioned, and they kind of are willing to accept slightly more expensive technology for the slight benefits. Yeah, I mean, you know, any social change takes a long time. So, I mean, if you look at social change as a system, it has a very long time process. You, you give the impulse, and the response takes decades mm -hmm. to show up. But at, uh, eventually it will happen, mm -hmm. I think. Anyways, I, I, I want to move fast. I very quickly, so o over almost past decade, from 2001 to recent, uh, like uh, last March, solar, uh, the retail prices of modules have gone through various uh, kind of uh, play, so initially they, throw, they dropped and then went up, and here there was this basically crisis in the economy and nobody knew what was going to happen, is solar good or bad, they went up, stayed flat, but 2008 it suddenly started coming down, okay? So in 2008 nothing happened, there was no breakthrough in efficiency, there was no, uh, nobody solved inter intermittency of the solar panels, there wasn't any specific, like, uh, big numbers of installation to actually uh, force the prices to go down. The main thing that happened was actually the, the China dumping battle that happened in the world. So what happened is that China's solar industry received massive subsidies from its government to, to actually create solar cells and solar panels and dumped all of them at very low prices because the industry was getting subsidies from the government. They could sell their product at very low prices. Actually, government, the government was compensated for the losses of those companies. So government told the companies, hey, sell yourself, sell your module at loss to lower your cost or even add your cost. I'll pay that for you, but for now, just do that and uh, sell it outside of uh, China, which is mainly U.S. market. And the result was uh, that it basically the killed. Yeah, killed all the manufacturing jobs and companies in the, in, in, in the U.S. and Europe, Europe, because those companies couldn't compete with this price. Nobody was buying their product, so they went out of business. They closed the doors, or they consolidated, or they laid off the people. I'm sure you have heard the stories like uh, uh, Solyndra or some other company that this would happen. It's basic, they couldn't compete with the prices of panel that China was offering. It's not that China was making money off of it. No, China was at a loss, but China was doing this to... Uh, Exactly, to actually push out all the competition and basically um, uh, they say, uh, and China itself still doesn't have, it doesn't have a big market. I mean, the Chinese people still aren't kind of into getting this new technology or solar panel. So China had to send all these things to the US and Europe killed the competition and basically have entire market, okay, to enlarge the market as much as possible, then it becomes the only manufacturer of solar panels. So everybody has to buy solar panels from China and uh, they usually say when you have, when you own your customer, you own the price and you own the volume. So basically, China becomes like a big, huge solar power, uh, like giant. Uh, everybody has to buy from China because all the competition is out. And China, hey, you know what? Now I'm, so, I'm selling with this. If you don't want to buy it, I'm sorry. There is no other person who can buy it. So there is no competition anymore from other countries. But still, the battle is going on. Lots of people have like uh, filed complaints internationally and so on. But what the U.S. Has done so far is just charging tariffs. So any solar panel that is being imported to U.S. from China, uh, the, the importer person has to pay 30 percent tariffs on top of that. And we recently uh, were brought in some uh, uh, panels from 
India, and they charged us uh, 250 percent of the average tariff. So U.S. is trying to charge this thing so people don't buy panels from China. They buy from local manufacturers. And you see, like the local manufacturers go through this uh, economic difficulty. They learn to go through the learning process and start and are and become capable of generating this kind of building the uh, solar panels at low prices. So they can. So there is a battle going on between uh, the U.S. and uh, China and the West. The second problem with solar panels uh, with renewable energy was the intermittency. This is just a, a graph that shows this is for a solar inst installation. This is for a wind turbine. It, it shows how, like during a day, you are, you are losing power. Maybe here because of the clouds or this, things like this, and it's here because the wind dies down. So this is a big problem with renewable energy. They don't exist all the time, you know? They only can generate uh, power and energy when you have the sun, when you have the wind. When you don't have it, the system doesn't work. So, this is another thing that everybody in this room can think about, the contribution that you can bring in into uh, uh, bring on the table to, ta to tackle intermittency. The, the, the most important way that you can tackle intermittency is to generate some kind of an energy source. Right? So when you have energy and you're generating more than what your uh, load is demanding, you just store the excess energy somewhere, and then when you lose your, uh, when you lose the sun or when you lose wind, use that stored energy and supply it to your customers. And energy storage can be in the form of thermal energy. It can be a flywheel that kind of uh, stores like and like uh, inertia. Uh, I don't know what you call that energy that is stored in like. Superconducting magnetic energy storage is very interesting. It's just like um, inductor. You know what inductor is. You know what inductor does is actually uh, stores energy in form of magnetic energy in the magnetic field. So it's Exactly. This is uh, basically so your conductor, you set up a copper, they are superconducting material. It's basically the same. But this has this only operates at very, very, very low temperatures. So you need to have systems around it to keep it at very low temperatures. If you can do that, if it makes sense, great. Like pump, 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 pump hydro or different kinds of batteries also are options for energy storage or any other new things that you guys will come up with. The low battery is the latest technology. It's basically you have like two big tanks of chemicals, and you throw the chemicals through a membrane, it generates electricity. Okay, and then when when you put electricity into this membrane, it generates the same uh, chemical and goes in the tank. So basically, you have big tanks uh, that energy is stored there. When you want to use the energy, you uh, create that, that electrochemical reaction or uh, store it uh, backward. But if, if you're thinking about an energy storage, you always have to think about energy density. So if you're comparing different energy storage op options, uh, you have to think about the cost, see which one makes sense. Self-discharge is like a side effect of an energy storage system. You know, if it sits there, it, it doesn't always keep the energy. Like, if, yeah, think of your uh, your water heater at home. If it heats up the water and, it, and you turn it off, after a few hours, it's cold, right? Because the, it kind of, the energy discharges out of the system. So you have to resolve these problems. And there is a round trip efficiency. So you, you send some, you 
and also life time. Uh, if, if you are using the batteries, you have a low life time, but if you are using like thermal or hydro, it's an unlimited. Again, it depends on your application and what you want to do with energy storage. But these are the factors that you need to be, uh, consider. Other arenas, I, I don't think talk too much about this, but you maybe take a note and see the, how you can again contribute. These are like smart grids are another up and coming area in renewable energies uh, that basically has a lot to do with the merging uh, computer software with networking with, uh, with electric uh, distribution networks. Okay? How the network struct infrastructure can be designed, what architecture would be the good one, how the grid should be optimized, because after five or ten years, when each house or like each big building has a like TV system, you have this all generating power generating node in your entire system. Currently, we have like this big, huge nuclear power plant or steam power plant. They generate enormous amount of energy and uh, electric lines, like overhead lines, bring that electric power to our houses. So currently the power grid is designed with that thing in mind. But once you know, each house now is generating 2 kilowatt, 3 kilowatt, like uh, the Yerevan city is generating like 15 kilowatt of power, then the whole system dynamic <coughs> changes. So how we can kind of dispatch this generation and consumption and what problems might come, uh, might be, uh, what kind of challenges we will face, we still don't know. Until the number of this distributed power uh, generation units become like, more prominent in our system and we start causing problems. It's good to think about them ahead of time, so when they happen we can resolve them. Uh, uh, about building automation, you, you know, people are working, you know, when you're not in a room, you a job or a like, heating system. These are like very beginner stages. They have a lot of room for development, demand response, and all the software and applications that come in controlling this big, huge infrastructure. I, I, I know that lots of students here have very strong background in software engineering and computer science. So this might be of particular interest in you know, thinking about and see how we can contribute and what kind of things we can add to make things work better. So I think since I'm already way over time, I'll stop right here. And uh, thank you all for being here and listening to this presentation. I hope Questions and questions?